what I do there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, here we are for the last one. So, Ted, Thomas, and I, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things the foundation has been doing and some of the things that we are going to be doing coming forward. So this is gonna be a somewhat informal chat because we're all tired, uh, but we're, we're feeling good. We're excited to be here. Uh, so we're gonna talk about our core development. It's a big one. Of course, Ted's gonna do that. I might chime in from time to time, which applies to all of it. Uh, Thomas is gonna talk about some of our education programs, grants programs, uh, what else, what did I miss? Bunch of other stuff. Bunch of other we'll stuff. Find out. We're just talking about all kinds of stuff, and then I'll talk about some random stuff here and there towards the end and throughout. So, yeah, let's have fun. Great. Let's talk about Core Dev. All right. Thank you, Josh. Yeah. All right. I'm here to talk about Urbit Core Development. Uh, I have a tendency to talk about this even when not asked to, so <laughs> I'm going to attempt to keep this brief. <laughs> Uh, I may or may not succeed, so please bear with me. Actually, don't bear with me. Uh, if it's too long, cut me off. So, all right, here we go. Urban Core Development. What I'm going to talk about is what the current status of the system is, roughly. Uh, what we want the current status of, sorry, what we want the status of the system to be one year from now, and what we're going to do uh, to get to get there. So, at the moment. Oh, sorry. There we go. At the moment, the system is stable in the sense that if you run your Urbit, it generally keeps running, more or less. It's not particularly robust. Uh, you can make your Urbit not keep running, and it doesn't, it doesn't take that much effort to sort of knock it over. Uh, and there are a lot of other um, reliability issues in general in a lot of different parts of the system. You may have heard that Urbit is not the fastest thing in the world. Um, this is true. It is not secure. You should know this. Um, there, most of the system has not been audited for security. Uh, if you install an app, that app has the ability to uh, reinstall your kernel and hijack your whole Urbit. So you need to trust the apps that you're, that you're installing. And finally, the, there's the infamous two gigabyte limit on how much data you can actually put into your Urbit. And this has been updated to 8 gigabytes this year, but that's, that's not very many gigabytes for 2023. <laughs> so where we want to be in a year is the opposite of this. Not just stable, but robustly stable. The thing should work, should be quite reliable, hard to break. It should be not slow. I'm not going to say it needs to be fast, actually. It's just that it should be... <laughs> The, the performance of the system should not be something that you're really worried about when you're building an application, for most applications. It should be credibly secure. And I'll get into what I mean by that. And there should be no more storage limit. The way that we're going to get there is by focusing. There are a lot of interesting projects that we could do. Many, many interesting projects and we have to not do them. <laughs> this is really the hard part in a lot of ways. Um, Eternally. I think, I would say that Philip has done a really good job of setting that tone for a long time. And um, we've got to continue that. So, in that vein, we're going to do a pretty small list of large projects over the next year. Um, the first one is to rewrite the knock interpreter. This is the Ares project that uh, Edward Amson spoke about earlier. We're rewriting the networking stack, which Joe Bryan talked about at um, the Cheyenne event earlier this year. There's something called namespace maximalism, which is about laying out data in a nice way, and that has repercussions throughout the system. And finally, there's some security hardening to address the security issues. So I'll go into these one by one and uh, until somebody yanks me off the stage with a vaudeville cane. So the knock interpreter rewrite, and their code name Ares. It has three main goals. One is make it not slow to run knock. 
Uh, another is store unlimited data, store and manage unlimited data in your Urbit. The current, um, the current version of Aries can store up to 16 terabytes, which should be enough for anybody. And, um, the, and the third thing is to make future improvements easier, right? to make it easier to develop on the Urbit runtime, make further improvements, such as parallelism and other, uh, other kinds of things. So these are the three goals. The way we're getting there is by doing these things. So there is subject knowledge analysis, which is a static analysis technique that was invented by Edward Amson for this purpose. And so what that does is it takes knock code, and without needing to run the knock code, it can analyze uh, what's called the subject, which means like the environment, all the data that is available to the code that's running. It can develop knowledge about the shape of that subject during different points of the computation that it would run, and it can use that to optimize the code and make it go a lot faster. So this is called subject knowledge analysis, and this has actually been completed, which is very exciting. The next thing is a new memory allocator. Um, yeah, round of applause for the subject knowledge analysis. It's one of those things that you may not know what it is, but it's, it's kind of a big deal. Um, so the next one is a new memory allocator. So uh, what this means is that, you know, Urbit has this one data structure called a noun, uh, and it's a tree of numbers. And that's, everything is just a tree of numbers, which means that as knock is running, we're allocating in memory, means we're like taking the, you know, the RAM that's in the computer, and we're assigning slots within that RAM to be different parts of that tree. And every time knock runs a little bit, it makes new mutant trees. And so we allocate cells, like pairs. We allocate pairs like nobody's business. You know, Lisp likes to allocate pairs. It's sort of known for this. But if you try to use a, you know, a very high performance Lisp runtime to run Urbit, it just it dies immediately. It cannot handle it. Um, so there, there's this uh, two stacks memory allocator um, that takes advantage of the constraints of the knock machine code uh, to, instead of having a stack and a heap, uh, the way that uh, many, the way that normal systems work, um, it has two stacks that grow toward each other because it can take advantage of the immutable nouns and the you know, strict stack discipline of knock. What this does is that it's, this makes allocating nouns very fast. Um, it's what's called a bump allocator. In any case, what this does for us is it means that as we're allocating tons and tons of these trees, they, that can go really quickly. And that's one of the major bottlenecks that makes running knock slow at the moment. So the third thing is a new custom bytecode language. We have a bytecode interpreter uh, in our current system called Vera, um, but uh, we need a new one for Aries. Um, and finally, there's a new persistent system called the Persistent Memory Arena, the PMA. And so this is a sort of interesting blend of some state-of-the-art uh, data management techniques inspired by LMDB and PHK, Ma PHK malloc. Uh, it's a copy on write B plus tree. It's very cool. Um, and so all these things are coming together to address those issues that I mentioned in the previous slide, right? When we have all these things running, and they're starting to come together, there was a very cool demo earlier. Knock will be not slow. The data storage will be unlimited. Uh, and it's written in such a way that it's intended to be extensible with things like parallelism. So that is the knock interpreter rewrite. Next, we're going to go to project Real number quick. two, the networking rewrite. On Monday, there's going to be another demo of Ares. Uh, so if you want to see how more of this works, you get into the weeds with the people that are developing it, you should come by on Monday. I think it's in the afternoon at about 3-ish. Yeah, OK. So come do that. Yeah, I mean, Ares is actually it's sort of funny, because it's sort of like, uh, uh, Hastuck Dibtux made a joke about a year ago that he's going to rewrite the Urbit runtime in unsafe Rust just to upset as many people as possible. Um, and that's basically what Aries is. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, all right. Networking rewrite. Um, the goals of this are to address all the problems with the current networking stack. So the first one is to make the peer-to-peer -peer connectivity uh, bulletproof. Uh, at the moment, it's, it can flake out here. Ten minutes. Ten minutes left. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we, we, we know TED for giving what we call TED Talks. They're like the inverse of a normal TED Talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so our connectivity in AIMS, which is the Urbis Networking Protocol, can flake out sometimes. Uh, this is the non-starter. has to never flake out. So that's priority number one. We need to increase the networking throughput, which is how much data per second can you actually send. That really should just be limited by your, you know, your hardware, not by Urbit. Uh, so Urbit needs to get out of the way there. And finally, we need to make the code easier to reason about. Joe was discussing earlier in the security panel about how you know, as he's doing this project, he's realizing that Ames in its current implementation is far too difficult to reason about to meaningfully claim any kind of security. It has to just be simpler, uh, dumber, and, and just there has to be less of it. <clears throat> so those are the goals here. The way we're doing that is by doing a few, do these four bullet points. We're going to unify the two networking protocols that we have at the moment, uh, which are AIMS for doing commands and FINE for requesting data. We're unifying those into the same protocol. Uh, so one packet format. We're embracing the concept of named data networking, which is a concept from Van Jacobsen, who's one of the uh, old networking gurus uh, from TCP, among other things. Um, and so that relates to the scry namespace, which I'll get into, in the, in the, that's the third of the four projects here. But embracing the named data networking gives us a stable set of identifiers for messages, packets, and all sorts, and for, in the networking perspective, that uh, makes some of the invariants uh, easier to maintain, and it also allows us to get a 50% uh, reduction in the number of disk writes uh, performed by the network uh, for the purposes of networking. So uh, part of how we get there is a, a new source-independent packet protocol. So if you recall from the original you know, 2010 blog posts uh, about Urbit, the idea is that Urbit's networking would be source independent, and this goes back to ide an idea of Van Jacobson's from five or so years before that, uh, which is that uh, it's a very different routing model for how does a packet go from me through some relays to you, and then how does the result come back to me. Um, so this is a, a very different way of doing that from how uh, most of the internet does it. Uh, the NDN, product does, NDN project does it in a similar way using something called a pending interest table. And uh, feel free to go harass Joe to see how that thing would work. Um, but that uh, is a, it's taking advantage of a, a, a property of our routing, which is that everything is, request, everything is request response at the message layer and at the, well, really at the packet layer. Um, and so that's a very useful constraint that we can use to make the peer to peer routing easier to reason about, which makes it easier to keep correct and performant. So finally, um, we're going to be optimizing the packet authentication. Because right now, uh, FINE, the read protocol, does a digital signature on every single kilobyte of data, uh, which is a problem that we like to call in the category of stop hitting yourself problems. Uh, and there are, several, there are a lot of these across Urbit. Right? So it's, this is, we just need to stop doing that. And so instead, we're going to use a tree hashing function called Blake3. And um, we're going to use that to have a packet authentication protocol that's much faster. So this helps us increase the throughput. So that's the networking project. The third of the four things is namespace. Third of the four projects that we're going to do over this next year is namespace maximalism. One of the uh, lowest layers in Urbit is something called the scry namespace. And this is a system of permalinks where any Urbit node, any Urbit ship, can post data at a path that's like a URL. And then there's a constraint that it can never overwrite the data at that path. So you can never publish two different values at the same path. So it's like everything's a permalink. Um, and there's a lot of structure to these paths as well. It gives you a lot of metadata uh, about you know, who not only who published this, but you know, which agent published it, like which piece of user space or which part of the kernel published this data, what date was it published at, um, some other things like that. Um, so this namespace has been inside of Urbit since the very beginning, but it hasn't really been usable by applications in a lot of ways. So the first stab that we took really at making this usable by applications sort of at scale 
was adding the Fine network protocol earlier this year for doing reads so that I can send you a request for data at some path, and if your ship published that path, then it'll send me the data. Which is, it's sort of a no-brainer, but we couldn't actually do that until a few months ago. Uh, now, there are limitations to Fine, that protocol, so we can't handle um, uh, private data, um, a number of other limitations. Uh, but before I get into those, I'm, I will talk about these goals. Like, why do we care about this namespace? And it's basically that we want it to be the case that when somebody writes an application for Urbit, that by default, it's both reliable and scalable. That shouldn't be something that you have to really go out of your way to do. The basic primitive you know, building blocks that the operating system gives you as a user space developer should make it so that if you just use those building blocks in normal ways, your application will be reasonably reliable and scalable. This is not the case at the moment. And the Scry namespace, this is our, our, our thesis here, is that the Scry namespace will make a big dent uh, in making the defaults much more reliable and scalable. Um, and this goes back to something that Ryan Lackey said earlier in the, uh, in the, also in the security panel, that the, in his experience, the, the best way to inculcate a culture of security, or one of the most important pieces there, is to make it so that the right thing is easier to do than the wrong thing. So that's part of why we want to use the scry namespace. The way we're going to do that is by expanding the use cases for, for the namespace to include private data. So we're going to have encrypted remote scry protocol so that I can ask you for a piece of data, ask you for data at some path that you only want to expose to just me or maybe just to a few other people. Right now, it only works for public data. So we have to improve that. Uh, we need a way to read at latest something like an HTTP GET request where I just say, hey, what's your latest value? Uh, so like for you know, data at some path where I don't know exactly what data was published at, but what, what was the latest one? So we need some protocol like that for initial synchronization. And then for ongoing subscriptions, where I'm you know, maybe listening to a chat channel that you're publishing new messages in, there has to be some way of having some sort of subscription interface over the network. Uh, so subscription-related protocol, we've variously, at different times, called that uh, sticky scry. And there are a few different uh, proposals that have been floated for how we're going to do that. And finally, uh, we're going to serve, serve data in the Scry namespace over HTTP so that web clients can also access this namespace. And uh, that's done uh, in the kernel, and then there's a runtime optimization that would be nice to do as well. So that's where we are on that. All right, and now with my remaining two minutes or so, I'm going to do a talk about security. Uh, <laughs> Good thing we already had. They just had a panel about right? it. Yeah, yeah we just, there's a whole panel. So, um, yeah, we're going to do these things. So there, these, there are several different dimensions of security. Um, and I didn't even list all of them here. In fact, I didn't talk at all about denial of service and other resource exhaustion attacks. Um, but when I think about security, uh, what are the pieces of it that, re that we really want to harden over the next year or so, I think about these. So data exfiltration, like can somebody, can, can somebody snoop on you on your private data? Can they hijack your system and get it to do things that you don't want it to do? Um, can somebody get you to install a malicious app like a you know Urbit Bonsai Buddy that then um, you, you know that then you know uh, does things that it's not supposed to do, interacts with other apps or with the kernel, uh, and then finally we also need to protect the host machine that Urbit is running on from Urbit itself in case Urbit in case Urbit gets hijacked. Um, so in order to do that, we need to do a few things. One is a user space permissioning system, which is sort of like your iPhone's permission system. You're like, hey, this app wants to use the camera. Now, our, things, our, uh, our problem here is a little bit different because these are long-running services that the user doesn't necessarily interact with. So that's a, it has to be done slightly differently. Um, but fundamentally, we just need to have a system in place that, where you can establish policies so that uh, applications can't interfere with each other or with the operating system itself. In a similar vein, we need a front-end sandboxing system that will take advantage of the browser's origin system so that if a front-end, like a, a web client for one app, uh, so that, that, isn't, that client isn't allowed to sort of circumvent the user space permissioning system by making requests to some other app that it's not supposed to have access to. And then uh, to protect the 
host machine from Urbit, that's a relatively simple one. We need to drop permissions. This is a pretty well-established technique in Unix. Uh, not to say that it's utterly trivial, but it's, uh, this is a well-trodden well ground here. And finally, when we think about hardening, we want to do a lot of fuzz testing, which means that you just spew essentially random data at an Urbit. Uh, and so we'll need to do that for peer-to-peer -peer packets over UDP, HTTP packets, and also do this with jets. So basically, we need to look at all the different pieces of the security attack surface in the runtime. This is a, most of this is runtime security. Um, and, uh, and basically throw as, me, throw as, much, you know, as much data at it as possible uh, and see if we can uh, flush out any bugs. Once we have all this stuff, then we can also get a security audit done uh, where you know, we really have people try to break it. But before we get there, before we do that, we want to have some some idea at first of like, all right, here you know, we've done, we've put in some effort. Also, then get the security audit um, as more of a you know, more of a stamp, less of like relying on that to you know, enforce our own security. And that's not the end of the security story by any means, but this is what we want to focus on over the next year. So I want to conclude, if I have time to conclude, um, by saying, ask not. Let me make sure I get it right. Ask not what your operating system can do for you. Ask what you can do for your operating system. Urbit is an open source project. This, is, uh, this belongs to the world. And we're also a relatively small group. Any one person here can make a big difference in the Urbit project. And so I encourage you to get involved, uh, help out, and see what you can do. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. We can actually um, go further on that question. So ask what you can do for your operating system. Um, I know that everybody in here, like a lot of you, are already working on this. Um, but at the Urbit Foundation, we also put a lot of effort into education. So if you don't know how to write Hoon yet, want to get involved, this is a place to start. There's actually a Hoon, Hoon Academy starting. Um, in a few weeks from now. But we find it really important to educate developers um, and make sure that they will get the grasp of the system and eventually even become core developers. That's why since this year, we started the foundation with two different schools. We, are now up to, we have now up to four schools. So this year, we launched two new ones. It's App, Work, App Workshop and Core Academy. And Core Academy is now, for the first time, running with about 14 attendees. Um, they give it an amazing review, and it really leads, leads even to our core developers to understand the system better. So, and by the way, something um, which you will notice soon is we've renamed all the schools. They're now academies. It's Hoon Academy, App Academy, App Workshop still, and Core Academy. So first core school is, uh, Core Academy is running. Um, and we also, since last assembly, have educated more than 90 people in Hoon, Hoon Academy. But education doesn't stop here. Developers look online for their resources and educate themselves most of the time. It's a quicker pace, and a lot of people um, find that more easy. So we want to try to make that as easy as possible for you as well. And that's why we did a complete refactor of the um, developer documentation sign. And it's live from now on on docs.urbit.org. Docs. Now, all the, all the Urbit developers know that this is quite a big deal because you know, it, it, it wasn't that great before, to be honest. Um, here's a small view of it. It's how it looks. Look it up. Education-wise, we have also made it easier than ever to um, educate yourself, how they say nowadays, um, on the website um, via video tutorials um, on all the Hoon, sc uh, Hoon School subjects, um, of course narrated by our beloved professor Lagref Nokfab. So check those out. They're really informative and a great way to start learning on uh, learning Hoon. Yeah. And we also know that searching stuff on the website was well, at least to say a pain in the ass. Um, well, that's extremely fast now, and you will find anything you need in, in a split second. So 
There you go, guys. In the coming weeks, we will keep working on this, and we will introduce something that we call modules for definitions. So on all the pages, if you scan through them and you don't remember what a certain word is called, click on it, and you have a pop-up module showing you through. We have light mode coming in um, and a bunch of other stuff. And we will keep updating the documentation also with um, a few, basically, for example, PALs that has been made not by us, um, but by PALDEV, and we integrate documentation about certain apps and other tools that basically have become infrastructure. We add documentation for those, so new developers don't get lost and have all the possibilities in one place. Another thing that we are launching in the coming months is called Urbit Labs, and this is basically a refactor of the Urbit Grants program. Urbit Labs will be a small community of people that work kind of within the foundation and um, will work on tooling for users and developers to make, you know, I don't know how your uh, ship looks like, but I installed like a bunch of apps that came out like, you know, two years ago or whatnot, and some part of my ship now looks like a graveyard. We want to make sure that that's not the case. We want to make sure that there is a bit more maintenance on the network on apps that you really want to keep using. Um, so that's why we're having Urbit Labs that's going to help, help out with the maintenance and building of good tools for users and developers. Um, this will also be the branch that will be working with partnerships. So tomorrow you will hear more about our partnership, for example, with the NIR, with NIR and the NIR Foundation. Um, and that will all be under the uh, umbrella of Urbit Labs. And what we also want to do here is like, make sure that there are new opportunities um, for young developers that reach further than only a grant. That said, one of the first products that we did a pilot launch last year with, but is now really open for anybody to use, is Authenticator, Urban Authenticator, that you can integrate right now into your website and have people sign up to your website via their uh, running ship. Um, all the documentation is live on docs.urbit.org. So if you run a website and you need credentials, use Urban Authenticator. Now, this is all developer focus. We also have a lot of other stuff that we do, right? Um, and we try to keep you informed. And one of the ways we did that with uh, throughout the last year is 0K. And I mean, you remember this one. When people join the code, do they redefine words to mean new things? Because that's a very common thing for codes to do. Interesting. You know, I like to say that Urban is only a cult in all the good ways and none of the bad ways, right? And so if something already has an existing meaning, we don't need to try to disturb that. Well, I feel like this is like a Venn diagram. I feel like there's a Venn, I'm just like sensing a Venn diagram, you know, or it's like one of these triangles where it's like, it's somehow gas keeping, gate girl bossing, and it's like you can have, you know, in order to not gaslight, you must gate keep because it's a trilemma. You it's can, a trilemma. You can only avoid uh, two of the three. We're trying not to gate keep, and we're trying not to gaslight, which means we're girl bossing. Famously, <laughs> it's science. You can't argue with science. <laughs> Zero K, um, ran by Anthony and Karina, um, is an absolute charm to, to look at. And it actually will teach you a lot about the ecosystem, about how Urbit works. They are really informative, but extremely well uh, recorded podcasts, I would say. Um, and of course, the shorts are all made by uh, Riff Pill Sitfill. So wh where are you? I want to have a big shout out for Riff Pill Sitfill. Thank you for making those brilliant shorts. He's hiding behind the tree, people. <laughs> okay, um, that was it from my side. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, man. I'm going to stay seated because I'm a little tired of standing. Um, the next two things I have are, you know, the, these are some work and flight thoughts. This is more future oriented uh, about kind of how I've been thinking about things that. Um, you know, we could do better, right? Like constructive criticism uh, of ourselves. Um, and this, this first thing is, is something that I'm ripping out of that Alan Kay talk again, uh, that was really, you know, I, I think put some things really well, right? And there's this, this graph that he had, looks like this. There's time on, on the y-axis, progress on the other. And when you think about how you're doing, a lot of times it, you know, you might think about it kind of like this. It's like, hey, you know, we get a little better. 
Okay, and then maybe there's some setbacks, we'll get a little better. We'll get, get better. But you know, over a long enough period of time, uh, we're overall getting better, and that's good, right? Well, what you can also do is you can draw this, this line at the top and say, okay, well, that's, that's perfection. Of course, that's where we want to be, but we can't really hit perfection, so we don't necessarily want to strive for that. Um, but then there's this other line in the middle, which is what you actually need to be at, right? What, what is actually good enough? And it's really important to have a, a really clear description of what that is. Because if you're getting better over time, but you're never at what is actually needed, you have this, this gap that is, uh, well, it's not good, right? You want to get to where you are at what is actually needed. And from there, you can strive for perfection, but you have to know where that is. And I think this is something that you know, we at the foundation really need to figure out. I've gotten this feedback from a lot of people. Um, you know, Chase is one of them at Vaporware that we need to have benchmarks, right? We need to have a very clear picture of what performance needs to look like. Uh, you know, like basically how the system should perform along a bunch of different dimensions to be considered, you know, where it needs to be. And so one of the things that I'm really wanting to figure out with core development next year in tandem with a lot of these big projects that are largely performance focused is what is that line? What does that look like? What are the things that are actually needed systematically across the whole system so that we can start measuring ourselves against it and make sure that we're actually hitting that? Um, I think we could, you know, if we have any time, we can maybe talk about this a little yeah. bit or you know, take some questions when we get there. Um, so that's one thing. You know, I wanna, you know, next year by the time we're at assembly, I wanna, I wanna have graphs. Um, I wanna have numbers about how the system performs and how well it is done over time. Um, because we're actually in a point where this thing is mature enough to where we can do this. Uh, and we have enough people that depend on this system to where we really should be doing this. Yeah. Okay, um, the other thing I wanna talk about is opening up. Um, you know, this project has been going for, oh, oh hang on, I'm gonna keep on sitting down there. Um, this project's been going on for 10 years now, of like really concerted effort, as I mentioned before. And, you know, what I'll say, like, this thing comes to mind, what, what got us here won't get us there. Those first 10 years, Orbit has been, has been a very insular community, right? Predominantly, tech, you know, I would say technically, by and large. Um, and that's been necessary, because Orbit is very much a contrarian piece of technology, and you kind of have to, uh, well, it's not necessarily ready to go mainstream. You don't want it to go out and be for everybody because you, you have to, like, you're still hammer, you know, fleshing out the details. We can't necessarily talk about what we want people to do because we're still figuring it out ourselves. And in recent years, we've crossed a threshold from you know, figuring out what it needs to be to having something that we're actually encouraging people to develop on. And at this point now, we need to find ways to make Urbit a lot more accessible to wider groups of technologists. You know, in large part because I think in, you know, in Urbit's early days, it was Martian software against Earth software. The idea that all of the, you know, the old systems were, they kind of needed to be replaced, right? They, they were overly complex, uh, solving for the wrong paradigm, and Urbit's old. You know, the ideas for this emerged before there was crypto at all. Uh, it hit at about the time that crypto was starting to become a thing that people cared about. But I think over the course of the last 10 years, there has been, you know, not just Earth software, but, but Moon software, if you know what I mean. Um, that, no, you don't know what I mean. Anyway, bad joke. Um, you mean because like, it moons, like number moons, go up? you know, that like number like, go up, like moon software. Go up, go up, I get yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was it. <laughs> anyway, could have used a graph. That would have been good. Um, like, what I'm trying to say is there are other software movements that are values aligned with us that we actually really need to go to a little more and try and be a lot more accessible to because they're allies, right? They actually care about the same things we do. Uh, and so I think... This is something we're going to be focusing on, is how do we make this technology more approachable? How do we get it to go mainstream by making it 
you know, in some ways less weird, right? Weirdness is good. We want some of that. Like, Urbit is a very beautiful project. Um, but it also does need to make an attempt at a point that it is reaching a level of maturity that people can develop on it uh, to become more accessible. So that's what I have to say about that. And with that, any questions for us? Well, either we were extremely clear or everybody's just too tired for any questions. Yeah, I think everyone's pretty tired. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty tired. You guys tired? Yeah, tired. <laughs> yeah. Good day. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we do, we do have um, one thing we have to mention. Oh, we do. So, tomorrow night, um, we've changed the plans a little bit. Um, our team has been, been working for the past few hours extremely hard. Um, but tomorrow night, we were able to organize a massive rave in the city. So, there's going to be an official urban rave tomorrow as a closing party in the city at Palacio di Tancos, same location as Demo Day. And um, yeah, we're still working this week on the uh, DJ lineup, but it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty good. So make sure you be there. Yeah, Raves are good. Rave is good. Yeah. yeah, we will need that after two days of conference. Yeah. Is, it, is there enough time to have a nap in between? In between like what? A long nap. We can recharge a little bit. In between the the, the two days. Just on the rave. When's the rave? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. We have time. Good. Good. All right. I'm going to need a lot of sleep. <laughs> cool. All right. Okay. No questions? Nothing else? I think we're good. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks, Bye. everyone. Hope you had a good day.